Good morning. Welcome to worship with the community of Westside Unitarian Universalist Church, where compassion leads us to work for justice and equality. My name is Reverend Frida Gillespie, and I am the interim minister. I'm glad you're joining us for our virtual service today. It is my hope that this gathering will renew your sense of community and connection and nourish your heart, mind, and spirit. Thank you to our technology helpers today, Caroline Nixon, Janelle Weaver, and Ken Leixing. And of course, Dr. Yuki Kumamoto, our wonderful pianist. Westside is a community of many beliefs, genders, and sexualities, a community of diverse cultural race, racial class backgrounds and a community of varied abilities and gifts. Some people here find inspiration in the great books, others in the great outdoors, and others still in great conversations. Whoever you may be, we welcome you to bring your whole self into this community. If you are so moved, you can try out the chat feature on Zoom by typing in some words of welcome to both members and visitors who are joining us this morning. On behalf of this church community, I also say to all, welcome. Today's order of service is a PDF. A link was provided via email and will also be posted in the chat for you to download. Most important is simply the opportunity to be present and connect together as the West Side community. So don't worry if you don't have the order of service. We won't leave you behind. As always, please continue to watch your email inbox, the church website, and our Facebook page for updates on church programs and opportunities. You can also stick around after our service ends today and if you would like to join us for a virtual coffee hour. I highly recommend it. I invite you to take a deep breath And from wherever you are, settle into the sacred space that we create together each week. Now let us work, worship together as we listen to this morning's prelude. are from Kathleen McTeague. We come together this morning to remind one another to rest for a moment in the forming edge of our lives, 
to resist the headlong tumble into the next moment until we claim for ourselves awareness and gratitude, taking the time to look into one another's faces and to see their communion, the reflection of our own eyes. This house of laughter and silence, memory and hope is hallowed by our presence together. Feel free to join in lighting our, your own chalice as I share these soul matter words. We light this chalice to remember the light within, to know that the hunger we feel inside is not an emptiness, but the echo of an inner wisdom that already knows what we need. May our time together help us welcome that voice and each other back home. Our chalice lighting song this morning is 362, Rise Up, O Flame. O flame, by thy light glowing, show to us beauty, vision, and joy. Rise up, O I invite you to join me in reciting the affirmation. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest of truth is a sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve others in community, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with creation. Thus do we covenant with one another. Our opening hymn is number 67, we sing now together.
Our Time for All Ages today will be presented by Nikki Kennedy. Apologies, uh, Nikki. Time for all ages. Hey friends, we are up at the church today trying to go live in worship, and we have had a few difficulties, so I appreciate your patience today. I have a book I found really beautiful that I'd like to share with you today, and it's called The Rabbit Who Listened. And I want you to close your eyes for just a minute and take a deep breath in and out. And I want you to kind of get comfortable and settle in. And I want you to listen to this beautiful story about the rabbit that listened. Hello, my name is Corey Dorfeld, and I want to talk to you about feelings. We all have feelings. Sometimes you might feel happy or sad or angry. The other people in your life also have feelings, and sometimes it can be difficult to understand why someone else is feeling a certain way. That's why I wrote and illustrated a book called the rabbit listened. I noticed that even grown-ups I knew sometimes didn't know how to act around someone feeling sad. In this book, there are many different animals who try many different ways to make the main character feel better, but only the rabbit is successful. I want you to pay attention, and hopefully by the end, you will understand why. Ready? Okay. The rabbit Listened, written and illustrated by me, Corey Dorfelt. First, we see the main character, and they are pushing a box. I wonder what's inside of the box. There were blocks. One day, Taylor decided to build something. Something new. Something special. Something amazing. Taylor was so proud. But then, ah, 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 psh, out of nowhere things came crashing down and here we can see Taylor feeling very sad the chicken was the first to notice Burp. What a shame. I'm so sorry, sorry this happened. Let's talk, talk, talk about it. Cluck, cluck, cluck. Bark, bark, bark. But Taylor didn't feel like talking, so the chicken left. Bark, 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 bark. Next came the bear. Grrrr! How horrible! I bet you feel so angry. Let's shout about it. Grrrr! But Taylor didn't feel like shouting. 
So the bear left. Rawr. The elephant knew just what to do. <coughs> Trumpada! I can fix this. We just need to remember exactly the way things were. But Taylor didn't feel like remembering. So the elephant also left. <coughs> One by one they came. The hyena. Hey, 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 let's laugh about it. The ostrich. Goop, let's hide and pretend nothing happened. The kangaroo. Tisk tisk, what a mess. Let's throw it all away. And the snake. <gasps> let's go knock down someone else's. But Taylor didn't feel like doing anything with anybody. So eventually, they all left. Until Taylor was alone. Taylor's still feeling very sad. In the quiet, Taylor didn't even notice the rabbit. But it moved closer and closer until Taylor could feel its warm body. Together they sat in silence until Taylor said, Please stay with me. The rabbit listened. The rabbit listened as Taylor talked. The rabbit listened as Taylor shouted. The rabbit listened as Taylor remembered and laughed. The rabbit listened to Taylor's plans to hide, to throw everything away, to ruin things for someone else. Through it all, the rabbit never left. And when the time was right, the rabbit listened to Taylor's plan to build again. I can't wait, Taylor said. It's going to be amazing. And here we can see that Taylor finally feels happy. All thanks to the little rabbit. So now that I've read the story, I want you to think about what the rabbit did. What did the rabbit do that was different? The rabbit allowed Taylor to feel exactly how Taylor needed to feel. So I hope this book helps you feel like you can ask the people in your life to be a rabbit for you when you're feeling sad. But most importantly, I hope it helps you understand that being a rabbit is the best way to be there for someone else. Thank you so much for listening. Goodbye. I loved that book. I hope you guys enjoyed it too. And I want to I want you to think for a second. That rabbit is kind of like some things that we already do with our congregation. The rabbit's like our check-in each week. As we gather, you guys are allowed to say what you're feeling and say what's on your heart. And it's okay, whatever that is. Our covenant groups are like the rabbit and they listen and our pastoral team also listens and they care. Thanks for coming today. It's good to see you guys. Have a great week. And remember, think about that rabbit this week. Bye. Thank you, Nikki and reader. That was great. Today, Today's joys and concerns will be shared by a representative of the pastoral care team, Christina Sellers. Good morning, everyone. My light's a little funny today, but you can hear me, so that's good. As we share our joys with others, those joys are multiplied. As we share our concerns, our community can offer its care. 
Please post in the chat if you have a joy or a concern you would like to share with everyone today and those who will watch the recording later. Joys and concerns can be submitted at any time via email to pastoralcare at westsideuu.org or through the web form located on the care and support page of the church's website. This week's joys and concerns include a joy from Linda and Bob. On October of 2012, Linda Hanratty and Bob, I'm sorry, Robert Van were married at Westside by Dr. Russell Elvin. We haven't forgotten all of you Westsiders along with other friends and family who helped with the occasion and then joined to celebrate with us. We especially want to thank, again, Linda and Myron Ice and their incredible handling of the reception. Beautiful memories. Um, I also have a concern. Here we go. It's popping up there. Let's see. Gary Randall has been hospitalized with pneumonia. He has responded well to treatment and is feeling much better this morning. Thank you, Sharon. We're so glad for that update. I'm glad he's feeling better and is responding to the treatment. We have a joy. Um, Donald's birthday is this Tuesday. Happy birthday, Donald. Let's see. We have a concern. My Aunt Betty passed away on Friday. Her funeral is this afternoon, but I can't attend because of the health issues. I'm so sorry to hear that. Could you tell me your name as well? I see your email, but I'm not sure um, whose concern that is. From Dana, we're thankful for the tech team. We know you are frustrated, and we really like watching Facebook Live. Just a little behind the Zoom service, but easier to watch together. Appreciate your efforts. That was Glenda Hood's Aunt Betty. That's Martin. I'm just going to wait a little bit longer in case anyone else is typing one out. All right, I don't see anything else popping up. Thank you so much for sharing those with us. Sharing draws our community closer together. Please know that our pastoral care associates are available to support you with deep listening and when needed through our in-reach fund or short-term financial support of members in need. We are here for you. Thank you, Christina. This morning's centering song is number 352, Find a Stillness. Sing along, but if you prefer, simply listen. On the wings of this music, I invite you to join me in a time of centering. Each week here at Westside, we open our hearts to those in our community who know both joys and challenges, and to all suffering beings. I will begin with a brief pastoral introduction before we move into a time for silent reflection. At that point, I will ring the bell to signal the start of the time for your own meditation, prayer, I will ring the bell again at the end. 
I invite you to close your eyes and check the alignment of your spine as Reverend Frida begins with a pastoral prayer. Spirit of life and hope and love, let our hearts be full of love as we share in the joys among this community. Let our spirits reach out in compassion to all who know sorrow as well, offering a loving presence to all those in pain. Westside has a long tradition of reaching out to the wider community in generosity. You'll find guidance in the order of service, the chat, and in the afterward email about three different causes to support how you can give. In addition to giving online through our donation webpage or mailing a check to the church, you can now use the Give Plus app available on Google Play Store or the App Store. Thank you all who, who are continuing to pay it forward towards your pledge in the church, which is keeping our mission going at this time. Thank you for your generosity. Now we will tur turn our attention to Reverend Frida, who will share this morning's reading. Our reading this morning is an excerpt from a book called Time to Think. I'm going to hold it up here. I hope it shows. Maybe it doesn't. Okay. It is by Nancy Klein. She's talking about her mother here. The day before she died, my, <clears throat> my mother said a startling thing to me. I apologize, she said, for the mess my generation 
has imposed on yours. I wish I could have left you a better legacy. I just hope I have left you a measure of courage to face what we have done and a measure of hope to do something about it. But regardless, remember that none of it was your fault. It all began long before you were born. My mother was not a sociologist, nor a business executive or consultant. She was just an ordinary person, shaken as I think most people are by what was happening in the world. I don't know if the, if the mess she was referring to was despotic war, people sleeping in dung on street grates, the 60 hour white collar working week, or the end of insect songs as the rainforests burn. In fact, it was probably all of those things. I didn't ask. I just hugged her. I told her that she herself had been for me the greatest legacy of all. And that was true. She had left me and my sister and twin brother and every life she had touched with not only the courage to face the mess, but also with perhaps the most important tool with which to do something about it. Without knowing it, she had also left to the world of business, organizations, and government a key to leadership. She had listened to us. She had given us time and space to think. My mother's listening was not ordinary. Her attention was so immensely dignifying. Her expression was so seamlessly encouraging that you found yourself thinking clearly in her presence suddenly understanding what before had been confusing, finding a brand new surprising idea. You found excitement where there had been tedium. You faced something, you solved a problem. You felt good again. She was there, present with you, riveted, fascinated by what scintillating phrase might tumble out of your mouth or what idea you might think of that would take her breath away. The process was so supple that you did not stop to notice it. You just enjoyed it. In fact, it was not a process to her. It was just the way life was. She simply gave attention. But the quality of that attention was catalytic. It would be 40 years before I would understand the power of what she was doing. That's the end of our reading. So my sermon today is called Deepening Our Thinking. Clear thinking poses a paradox to us. Anyone who's tried to think deeply about a problem or situation knows that you need a certain amount of silent reflection to get to new ideas. On the other hand, without others, it is easy to get mired in preconceived notions that are a barrier to solving anything. So we need to be alone and we need to be with others. Nancy Klein has found that there are actual conditions that are conducive to human beings thinking. And these are conditions that we can create intentionally. Parker Palmer in his book, A Hidden Wholeness, teaches us about circles of trust, where a trusted group of friends or colleagues gather to listen to one person and help guide their thinking with penetrating questions. For example, if I were stuck trying to decide between two different careers or jobs, each of which had differing advantages and disadvantages, I could call upon these steadfast souls to sit with me and let me talk through everything I can think of about the decision. They would listen to me without interrupting as long as I wanted to talk. When I finished, they might ask a question that by answering, I could come to a greater clarity. But otherwise, their entire role is to listen attentively and deeply. In our small group ministries, we use a similar technique. And actually, the purpose of small group ministry is to learn how to plumb the depths of our thinking and feeling, as well as to learn to listen deeply. Small group ministry is talked about as a way to deepen friendship. But it actually, it is a training. It is training us in deep listening. 
to ourselves and to others. It is not for the faint of heart. It requires discipline and control of our thoughts and impulses to talk, to give advice, which is almost never helpful, and to relate our own experience to the other person. It is a spiritual practice and it isn't easy. It is definitely a different experience than our day-to-day -day interactions. But why not have a free discussion and exchange advice about whatever this concern is? Because when the discussion is freewheeling, we are reacting to others' thoughts and ways of speaking. Often we are not listening at all, but waiting to share our brilliant insights or tell a joke or a story. No one gets to think deeply and thoroughly about anything. New ideas do come up sparked by such a conversation, but they're half formed and require a lot of polishing before they can be acted upon. I wonder if in business meetings or church committees, you've ever seen the chairperson use a listening technique where every person has as long as they need to share their thinking about an issue, where silence is not automatically filled, but rather people are allowed silence to think more deeply. My experience of business in commercial, nonprofit, or church committees are all the same. Something is brought up for attention and the matter is dispensed with as quickly as possible. People are allowed to talk, but interruption is okay and they know they have only a short time to share a thought because others are waiting to share theirs and everyone wants the meeting to end. Silence is entirely absent. This applies to serious matters as much as simple ones. Basically, it is not socially acceptable to take time to think. If you watch TV, every show portrays people interacting without any pauses to think, except commercial breaks. Snappy lines seem effortless and natural to TV characters. We think that is how we should be, but our lives aren't scripted. We must create as we go. There are many cases where a problem is fairly simple and can be solved by a short discussion satisfactorily. But when a problem is more complex, this approach fails time and time again. We don't see it as a failure of technique, but blame the problem. However, to the frustration of all involved, it is okay to revisit a problem meeting, meeting after meeting with no solution in sight. Usually rather than solving it, Conditions change slightly and it can be forgotten for a while. Rest assured that it will rise up again at a later point in time and be just as confusing as the first time. Former board members will remember the problem of who gets a key to the church or the problem of the roof leaking or the issue of how we do our accounting. I could go on and on and I know you recognize the pattern. It's frustrating to everyone. It's okay to spend five hours spread over five meetings for the same two people to talk about whether to switch to QuickBooks, but there never is enough time to simply allow each person to apply their very excellent minds to the problem without being interrupted. We need, we need to realize that tools are needed for thinking just like tools are needed to build, for building and creating anything. There are specific techniques that encourage creative thought and techniques that encourage and ensure that nothing changes. We tend to value high productivity, quick thinking, shooting from the hip without realizing that these techniques leave us uncertain, tense, and unresolved. It would behoove us all to learn the techniques that allow us to come to the best possible solutions to problems, right? I think so. So listening and allowing each person to talk freely is one important technique. The presence of others deepens our thinking and the freedom to be silent allows far more ideas to come forward. Klein and her staff have found that this leads to better and more creative decisions every time. Another technique is one that I remember um, a parishioner bringing up in her homily during a youth service. Benedict Spinoza says it this way, the cause of all confusion arises from the fact that the mind has only partial knowledge of a thing, either simple or complex, 
and does not distinguish between the known and the unknown. And again, that it directs its attention promiscuously to all parts of an object at once without making distinctions. Therefore, it follows that if a complex object be divided by thought into a number of simple component parts, and if each be regarded separately, all confusion will disappear. So I will translate this. Confusion comes from looking at something as a whole rather than seeing its parts. If we break the object down into simple parts, all confusion disappears. Anything can be understood this way, whether it's calculus or an accounting problem. Spinoza says that our minds only comprehend simple ideas. I don't care how smart you are, that is the way our minds function. A simple idea is by definition clear and distinct. I heard a very interesting call-in program on NPR about the time of the Sandy Hook shootings about gun control. It was a lesson in being specific. A man who supports the idea of gun regulation, who also owns a number of guns and likes to shoot guns, spoke about the previous gun control law banning automatic weapons that was rescinded. He said that the writers of the bill didn't know anything about guns, and he gave several examples of parts of the law that made no sense in actual reality. Specific accessories were named that either didn't really exist, like silencers, which are a fiction of TV and movies, or parts were banned that didn't contribute to the problems the law was supposed to solve. We've all come across things like this in our lives. Someone is enthusiastic, idealistic, but ignorant, and they end up losing the respect of those who do know about guns. This is not a problem of gun control, but rather a problem of thinking. Being clear about what we know, and even more importantly, what we don't know, is vital to solving anything. But we really don't want to take time to learn, do we? It is so much work, and it takes so much time. However, there's plenty of time to debate gun control. This isn't the only reason some people oppose gun laws, but it does bring to light something that makes a complex issue even more complex. So we have to understand the specifics of anything in order to really see how it should be used or could be used. That's the second technique for thinking. There is one more that I'd like to share and it's one we all know well. It is so easy to make assumptions that turn out to be false or jump to conclusions before one knows all the facts. This is the basis of many a story plot and many a joke, like this one. It was autumn and the Indians on the reservation asked their new chief if it was going to be a cold winter. Raised in the ways of the modern world, the chief had never been taught the old secrets that had, and had no way of knowing whether the in winter would be cold or mild. To be on the safe side, he advised the tribe to collect wood and be prepared for a cold winter. A few days later, as a practical afterthought, he called the National Weather Service and asked whether they were fo forecasting a cold winter. The meteorologist replied that indeed he thought the winter would be quite cold. The chief advised the tribe to stop, stock even more wood. A couple of weeks later, the chief checked in again with the weather service. Does it still look like a cold winter, asked the chief. It sure does, replied the meteorologist. It looks like a very cold winter. The chief advised the tribe to gather every scrap of wood they could find. A couple of weeks later, the chief called the weather service again and asked how the winter was looking at that point. The meteorologists say, we are forecasting that it will be one of the coldest winters on record. Really, said the chief, how can you be so sure? The meteorologist replied, the Indians are gathering wood like crazy. <laughs> this problem of making false assumptions can get us into arguments and excuse me, accusations that have no basis in reality. My wife is always suggesting to me to ask a secondary question, like, how can you be so sure? Or what do you mean by that? Or any number of clarifying questions. You might remember a Peter Sellers movie called Being There. It's about a simple-minded gardener named Chance, 
who lived his whole life in the estate of one man until the man died. Then Chance wanders away from the estate, which was all he knew until he entered the city. There he discovers TV, which fascinates him through it. He is accident, uh, which fascinates him. He is accidentally run down by a wealthy couple while he's watching TV through a store window. They take him home and they mistake his simple comments about gardening as wisdom about business and the current economic conditions. He gets more and more entangled with people in power who see him as a guru. All the while, he is just repeating phrases that he hears on TV. It's quite silly, but Seller won a Best Actor Academy Award for his performance. Perhaps the lesson is that we are often conversing with our own assumptions rather than the other person. We hear what we expect to hear rather than exploring what the person is really about. This leads to unnecessary conflict or unrealistic expectations. And that was so much what the Time for All Ages story was about today. People, people, animals made assumptions about what the poor boy was thinking and what he needed. And none of it was right. It wasn't until the rabbit listened to him and listened to him deeply, let him speak when he wanted to speak and tell the rabbit what was going on, that he, he learned something and they were able to make some progress. What this is all leading to is that we can think, as Nancy Klein says, for ourselves, rather than going along with the group or letting bad habits prevent us. It's important to remember that we need others to clarify our thoughts and we need silence to allow us time to think more deeply. With the right environment and willingness to trust the process of our mind, we can be powerful creators of good ideas. May it be so. I invite you to join me now in singing our closing hymn, number 354, verses one and four.
closing words are from Robert Mabry Doss. For all who see God, may God go with you. For all who embrace life, may life return your affection. For all who seek a right path, may a way be found and the courage to take it step by step. As we extinguish our chalice across the country this morning, please join me in our closing congregation. Let us go in peace, believe in peace, and create peace in our lives and in the world. May it be so. If you'd like to participate, 